And C-SPAN 3 History returns tonight at 8 Eastern with a look at President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh, We're going to leave this program for live coverage as the House Select Energy and Independence and Global Warming Committee gets an international look at global climate change. They'll hear from representatives from Norway, Chile, South Korea, and Germany. Chairman of the committee is Ed Markey of Massachusetts, James Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin, the ranking Republican. It's just about to get underway live here on C-SPAN 3. Thank you so much for uh, coming here uh, this morning for this very important briefing from some of the most uh, distinguished people in the world who are working on the issue of uh, climate change. This week began with 150 high-level representatives of governments, including over 80 heads of state gathered at the United Nations, demonstrating their commitment to meet the scientific urgency of global warming with equal political urgency. The message to all countries was clear. We need action now to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of global warming on the people and the planet. The week will end with the world's biggest polluters participating in a different conversation hosted by President Bush at the White House. The premise of the conversation at the White House is not action now but rather more talk and less action. Instead of setting concrete targets for actual reductions of global warming pollution, the President appears to be conducting a global filibuster in which he will ask the biggest sources of the gases which could doom us to share aspirational goals. Instead of action, we will get more hot air. The world is not fooled. It knows that aspirational goals are really just procrastinational, and if the President keeps this up, he is going to leave us all with dangerously perspirational impacts of global warming. The single most effective way of advancing the negotiations of the next international climate agreement uh, would be for the United States to commit to mandatory domestic reductions of heat-trapping gases. Later today, I will send a letter signed by dozens of my colleagues to the President asking him to work with Congress to enact such legislation. In other countries, uh, they are looking for action in Washington, D.C., uh, and they should look to this Congress. This summer, the House and the Senate both passed energy legislation that could lead to significant reductions in global warming pollution once the two bills are reconciled. Key provisions in these bills could lead to a 44 percent reduction in emissions from our current trajectory. We can't mortgage the children's and the planet's future by continuing to emit global warming pollution in the atmosphere unabated. We need to achieve real reductions now. The energy bill will be a significant down payment on these necessary emissions reductions, but we're not stopping there. To further reduce global warming pollution, uh, the House will soon consider legislation that will put us on a path for an 80 percent reduction of our emissions by 2050. We can invest all the money we want on research and development, but to truly transform our energy system, we must put in place the policies that drive the deployment of the renewable technologies and energy efficiency strategies that result in big payoffs in money saved, jobs created, and global warming pollution eliminated. And we have an obligation to adopt these policies. When the Chinese and Indians look up in the sky, they see red, white, and blue CO2. The United States alone is responsible for over a quarter of the carbon dioxide increase seen in the atmosphere in the last 150 years. While China's total annual emissions may now equal those of the United States, 
U.S. emissions are still four times greater than China's on a per capita basis. We won't avert climate catastrophe without all countries doing their fair share to control global warming pollution. To bring everyone on board, the United States must lead, not impede, by making the commitments to saving the planet that we have already seen from Europe and Japan. We don't stand a chance if the United States does not live up to this responsibility. The recent 20th anniversary of the Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone layer reminds us of what it takes to ensure a successful international environmental treaty. United States leadership, flexibility in the face of evolving science, and fair and binding commitments uh, for developed and developing countries based on their circumstances. We have done it before. We can do it again. Congress is committed to achieving these requirements in the next International Global Warming Agreement. Participants in President Bush's uh, meetings uh, should ask if he is ready to do uh, the same. Uh, we are honored with the guests that we have here today. Uh, let me turn and recognize the uh, ranking member of the Select Committee on Global Warming and Energy Independence, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> A decade ago, I traveled with several of my colleagues to Kyoto as chair of the congressional delegation to the now famous climate change treaty that was being negotiated there. Early on, I had suspicions that a treaty which targeted emissions by the U.S. and other industrialized countries but ignored the CO2 released by emerging economies like China and India would not get a warm reception either in Congress or amongst the American public. In fact, the U.S. Senate made a big statement prior to the Kyoto negotiations by voting 95 to nothing to express opposition to negotiating any climate change treaty that would harm the U.S. economy and fail to include emerging economies. One consequence of that vote was that President Clinton decided not to even bother sending the Kyoto Treaty to the Senate for ratification, even though he signed it. Perhaps the reason for that was that his appointee as head of the Energy Information Agency, a part of the United States Department of Energy, testified in 1998 before the Science Committee that compliance with Kyoto would result in approximately an 80 percent increase in the cost of energy in the United States, whether that be electricity, fuel oil, natural gas, or gasoline. And those types of increases are neither economically sustainable nor politically sustainable, because no politician in a democracy can get reelected uh, if they support increasing the cost of energy by 80 percent on their voters. So the problem was not with the Congress nor with the Senate, but with an administration with the help from former Vice President Al Gore that pursued a treaty that was very popular with people overseas but which have no chance of ratification in the United States. We must not make that mistake again. Momentum is building for a new global climate change treaty. We are continued this week with the UN's high-level event on Monday, which will continue later this week with the State Department's meeting of world major economies, which the President will address on Friday. These two meetings will help lay the groundwork for more formal negotiations this December in Bali, Indonesia, where diplomats from around the world will try to find out what was missed in Kyoto, which is a treaty that can produce positive environmental results without creating economic havoc. A decade after Kyoto, it is clear to me that the treaty produced far too few results. It is a failure, and I am not alone. This week, the executive director of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Dutch diplomat Ivo de Boer, stated that from the perspective of the environment, Kyoto could be considered a failure. He said, and I quote, you could, I suppose, say it's a failure from the point of view of the atmosphere, from the point of view of the climate, because it's only managing to reduce greenhouse gases by a little under 5 percent. So in that sense, you could call it a failure, unquote. Mr. DeBoer did offer some praise for the Kyoto Treaty by putting in place some needed architecture, but this statement alone tells me that Bali must not be a 21st century version of Kyoto. And let me state that 
contrary to what I expect to hear from our witnesses today and from the opening statement of the chair of the committee, that if we continue on in the business of talking about a mandatory cap and trade system that China and India will never sign off on, we will have repeated the mistake that began in Berlin in 1995, was continued in Kyoto in 1997, and which continues to this day. I give President Bush a lot of credit for engaging the Chinese and the Indians, which have so far stonewalled uh, any type of talk about greenhouse gas reductions into getting into these discussions. And he should be given praise and not condemnation for that. I was also pleased to see Secretary General Ban Ki-moon say on Monday that a complete divorce from fossil fuels is unrealistic and the technological development is essential for progress on global warming. I think Secretary of State Rice is right when she said on Monday, the world needs a technological revolution. I would add that the world also needs a revolutionary new climate change treaty that will keep energy and economic growth abundant while making carbon dioxide scarce. Validating old press releases isn't going to do it. And I hope that this week's discussion will move us down that path. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, to our witnesses, welcome to the United States Congress and uh, to a, um, a very, very intense debate that uh, is already well underway. So what, we, what we've done is we've uh, worked with the minority members of the committee to not have this be a formal hearing, um, but rather a briefing so that uh, we can hear from our very distinguished uh, witnesses. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and we have one of the most distinguished panels that will appear before Congress on any subject um, this year. Uh, in May, United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed three special envoys on climate change. We are honored that they are all here with us this morning. Uh, Dr. Bruntland will present an opening statement on behalf of all three, uh, but I will introduce them all right now. Uh, and we also will have uh, the, um, the uh, Minister, Federal Minister for Environment, Nature Conser Conservation and Nuclear Safety uh, from, um, uh, from Germany, who will also testify uh, after, uh, after um, uh, uh, Dr. Bruntland. So let me begin by saying that uh, since 1981, uh, Dr. Gro Harlem Brundtland has served three terms as Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Norway, leading its government for more than 10 years. In 1983, at the request of the United Nations, she also established and chaired the World Commission on Environment and Development, which is best known for developing the broad political concept of sustainable development in its report, Our Common Future, published in 1987. The Commission's recommendations led to the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, where the original UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed. In May of 1998, she was elected Director General of the World Health Organization. Uh, she held that position until 2003. She began her career as a medical doctor uh, in the Norwegian public health system. Uh, if you could uh, begin your testimony, and then I will introduce your uh, two colleagues, Dr. Bruntland. We very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Markey and uh, distinguished committee members, this hearing is extremely important and could not be timelier given Monday's historic high-level event on climate change at the United Nations. This past weekend's important decision to accelerate implementation of the Montreal Protocol and President Bush gathering on energy security and climate change this week. Today's briefing is a welcome opportunity to discuss what has happened at the UN and what this means as we look forward to Bali in December. In order to prepare Monday's high-level meeting, the Secretary General asked the three of us to engage with heads of state and government to help elevate government's consideration of these crucial issues. From Brasilia to Beijing and Pretoria to Port Moresby, we have held consultations with more than 30 countries in six continents. 
These discussions with key stakeholders not only helped to shape Monday's event, but also provided a clearer picture of the global politics of combating climate change. We now have a common understanding to mitigate the effects of global warming and to protect the environment for this and future generations. We need strong leadership and action, and it's not too late. Acting on climate change can be consistent with the growth and development aspirations of both developed and developing countries. The science is indisputable. Global warm warming is real, and it is already affecting people around the world. According to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the evidence is now clear. Human activities are causing glaciers to melt and sea levels to rise, putting water and food resources at great risk. For one third of the world's population, living in dry lands, especially those in Africa, changing weather patterns threaten to exacerbate desertification, drought, and food insecurity. At the same time, several low-lying island states are in danger of disappearing. The IPCC concluded that measures exist and are affordable. Now a political response based on science is needed. Since the Kyoto Protocol's targets expire in 2012, there is growing consensus that a new agreement must be in place in time. World leaders need to push the talks forward. A great opportunity will be at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference in Bali in December. <clears throat> now, as you said, Mr. Chairman, UN saw the largest ever group of world leaders Monday discussing climate change. 80 heads of state, and government present, with 150 governments altogether. They were joined by local government, civil society, and business leaders, demonstrating that everyone has a role to play. The discussions were fruitful, and the desire for action was strong. There was a clear call from world leaders for a breakthrough on climate change. Now, throughout the day, leaders indicated that we need to step up the pace. There was recognition of the need for an inclusive process on a new international climate change deal at Bali. This process needs to cover all aspects of the solution to climate change. Adaptation, emissions reductions, carbon sequestration in land, forests, climate-friendly technologies, and the necessary financial aspects. The Secretary General's event was not meant as an occasion for negotiations, but it did express the political will of world leaders to tackle climate change through the most appropriate global venue, the United Nations. Leaders emphasized that any solution has to be equitable and based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, and any action requirement has to be commensurate with the respective capabilities. Nevertheless, there was also broad-based agreement on the need for much deeper emissions reductions by industrialized countries, which must continue to take the lead in that respect. It was encouraging to hear many of the leaders from industrialized countries themselves expressing their willingness to do so. Climate change is a major global challenge, not just because its cause and effects transcend national boundaries, but also because it requires cooperation and coordination by all parties. These are precisely the kinds of issues for which the UN was established. Local, national, and regional initiatives are indeed welcome and can complement, but I believe cannot replace the global effort required. The UN has assisted in bringing the best science, the likely impacts, and the probable costs to the attention of governments and the general public through the so-called IPCC. It is through the World Meteorological Organization that the world is able to obtain much of the data that is needed in the study of climate change. And it is through the United Nations Environment Program and other agencies that action has been taken 
on environmental concerns such as the phase-out of ozone-depleting substances. The UN has been central to the successful results of the Montreal Protocol in reversing ozone depletion. Last Friday, on the 20th anniversary of the Montreal Protocol, the 191 parties signed a landmark agreement to freeze production of ozone-damaging uh, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, an ozone-depleting substance that is also an extremely potent greenhouse gas in, by 2013. Without this agreement, experts estimate that the production and consumption of these gases would have doubled by 2015, adding to the twin challenges of ozone depletion and climate change. It is encouraging that all participating countries agreed on legally binding targets to phase out this substance. Moreover, development cooperation is essential to the management of the environment and natural resources. The UN has helped bring clean water to communities, encourage land use choices that spur sustainable development, and help achieve major gains in energy efficiency around the world. And finally, the Framework Convention on Climate Change has established a legal framework for action and for global cooperation. Through the Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism, important private investments are being channeled into emission reduction actions in developing countries, such as China. The role of the U.S. here, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, is crucial, and there is no time to lose in addressing the warming of our Earth's atmosphere. Business as usual cannot carry on. The United States has been the indispensable leader of the world in addressing many global challenges over the last several decades. U.S. leadership in the area of climate change is essential, not only because the U.S. is a big emitter of greenhouse gases, but because the U.S. is on the cutting edge of developing technological solutions and bringing them to the global market. The U.S. has fully participated in the U.N. Climate Change Convention and in the preparation of the IPCC reports. Specific and bold steps now need to be taken. Collaboration and cooperation should be the guiding principles of a global response. On climate change, we know no one can go it alone. So currently, human activity is compromising human security. Policy choices made in Washington, California, Texas, Beijing, or Brasilia have real implications for people in Tuvalu, Barbados, and Bangladesh. As stated by the Secretary General in his summary of the event, action is possible now, and it makes economic sense. The cost of inaction will far outweigh the cost of early action. A successful global response to climate change depends on the participation of all countries. But while climate change is affecting everyone, it will hit the poorest and the most vulnerable the hardest. Climate change should be addressed in a way that is fair and that meets the economic, social, and environmental concerns, the three dimensions of sustainable development of communities in a holistic manner. Mitigation and adaptation measures must be implemented hand in hand. In the long term, technology holds great promise for reducing the cost of addressing global warming. But there is a need for greatly increased investment, both in research, development, and deployment. A global challenge is before us, but there are clear and actionable steps. Just as the governments in Montreal acted decisively last week, we must now seize the opportunity to deal with the climate change issue in a comprehensive manner. Thank you for your time. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, let me introduce um, the other two special envoys on climate change. Uh, the first is Dr. Uh, Han uh, Sung Su, who was president of the 56th session of the United Nations General Assembly in 2001 and 2002, when he received the Nobel Peace Prize for 2001 on behalf of the United Nations. 
He has had an illustrious career in academia and public life in his home country, the Republic of Korea, where he served in numerous posts, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister uh, and Minister of Finance. He was a member of the Korean National Assembly uh, from 1988 to 2004. Uh, he has had a distinguished career. He has a Ph.D. in economics in, uh, from the University of York, and he taught economics uh, at York and Cambridge before he returned to be a professor uh, of economics at Seoul National University. Um, and next to him is Mr. Ricardo Lagos Escobar, uh, who served as Chile's president from January of 2000 until March of 2006. After stepping down from the presidency, Mr. Lagos established the Foundation for Democracy and Development and now serves as its president. The organization is dedicated to creating sustainable economic growth and development. In April of 2006, he formally took up his post as president of the Club of Madrid, where he led the organization to increase its involvement in environmental issues. He studied law at the uh, University of Chile, obtained a Ph.D. in economics from Duke University in the United States, uh, and he has had an incredible uh, career uh, across many, many issues uh, that makes him one of, of, of our most uh, distinguished uh, citizens uh, on the planet. Um, so I would ask uh, either of you if you would like to add anything to uh, Dr. Brundtland's testimony. Uh, and if you would, you can uh, press the microphone and begin, uh, or we can just wait until the question and answer period. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that we will better wait for some question from, okay. from the panel. Thank Good. you. So we. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, thank you, and uh, we are very much honored to invite this five for your committee. Thank you. Thank you. And so now we'll hear from our next um, witness. Uh, Mr. Sigmar uh, Gabriel is Germany's Federal Minister for Environment, Na Nature Conservancy and Nuclear Safety and has served in this position since November of 2005. In this position, he has been instrumental in the adoption of policies in Germany and the European Union to create new jobs, increase the use of renewable energy and decrease global warming uh, pollution. Uh, he has previously uh, served in a number of other political positions. Uh, he began his career, however, as a teacher. And as I think we will all see from his testimony, there is a lot that we can learn from him. Uh, whenever you are ready, uh, Mr. Gabriel, please begin. Mr. Chair, um, honorable members of the selected committee, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the privilege. Uh, to speak uh, to the Congress, but I don't think that I'm in the role of the teacher here. Uh, uh, um, maybe it was the honestly job I ever had in my career. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, when, I, when I understand my role here well, then uh, maybe it's not necessary to add something to what uh, um, Madam Brundtland said before, but maybe to show you or to tell a little bit about the role and the position and the perspective of the, of the European Union and of Germany, um, because we are 500 million inhabitants in the European Union. Uh, we are uh, a high industrialized region. Um, and uh, although we are a in high industrialized region, we uh, think that uh, a climate policy is not uh, discourage, not, not a danger for economic growth and economic development, but it's a pillar of sustainable uh, economic success in the European Union and of course also in Germany. And um, so uh, the European Union and uh, of course Ger Germany sees uh, an engagement in cli climate policy um, uh, as uh, the of a substantial um, 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 commitment to uh, not only to environmental questions, also to economic questions. And we want to show that it's possible to decouple economic growth from uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, to decouple economic success from uh, increased demand on energy. And I think that the role of the European Union is to show, especially 
uh, developing countries and newly industrializing countries that it's not only a theory, uh, but it's possible in practice to decouple uh, economic growth and economic success from the emissions of greenhouse gases. So with its decisions of March this year, the European Union took on the leading role in climate protection. Within the framework of an international climate protection agreement, the European Union wants to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent by 2020 compared to 1990 and independent of the outcome of international negotiations which should start in Bali in December this year, we want to cut emissions by at least 20 percent by 2020 and our energy goals are an essential element of this climate strategy. The European Union wants to increase its energy efficiency and the share of renewable energies by 20 percent by 2020. The European Union is convinced that our climate protection efforts offer great opportunities and is no danger for the economic development of the Union. And by the way, whatever we see in the debates between developing countries and developed countries in the international climate negotiations, we, can the sa we, we see the same debates inside the European Union between the well-developed member states of the European Union, the old West, West European members of the European Union, and of course the East members of the, uh, the East European members of the European Union, because they are not so well developed. And of course, we have internal discussions how we can uh, reach a better economic development in the East part of the European Union. Um, uh, and without damaging the climate and without uh, getting higher emissions from greenhouse gases. So um, uh, the discussions between developing countries and developed countries are well known in the European Union. Uh, maybe it's another level, but in substance is the same discussion uh, inside the Union. The European Union um, uh, 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 is convinced, I said it, that our climate protection efforts great opportunities and the transformation to a low carbon economy will enhance our competitiveness, create new jobs and make an essential contribution to more energy security. The European Union considers that carbon markets the most important instrument for this purpose. The Union is uh, convinced that the US can and should make its contribution to a climate protection regime. The political activities in particular during the last months in Congress states and industry in the U.S. show that the attitude is changing in favor of an ambitious climate protection policy. My country, Germany, has also set itself ambitious targets. By 2020, we are aiming for a 40 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as compared with the base year 1990. This is 10 percent more than the European Union targets. And for my country, climate policy is the most important pillars, pillar for economic development because we want to have um, uh, more independence from, uh, the, from the import of uh, energy resources. Uh, we want to be more efficient in the use of energy. We want uh, to use the money for warming our houses, not for warming our gardens. Uh, and we want to create a new industry and new jobs in the field of advanced energy technologies and renewable energies. So with the recently adopted future-orientated energy and climate package in my country, which is unique, I think, in the European Union and maybe worldwide, we have moved a big step closer to reaching our target. The package of measures will provide impetus for all carbon dioxide relevant key areas and promote climate protection. Next to the significant increase in energy uh, efficiency, the massive expansion of renewable energies is the essential pillar of our national climate protection program. This will help us to achieve both our climate protection targets and the security of energy supply. And maybe it's interesting for you to hear that yesterday German industry supports the package of the German government uh, in the last month, of course, we had hard discussions with the industry, but today they, they offered, uh, yesterday they offered and published an own report made by McKinsey, and they said that it's possible to reach the German target, uh, and it's possible to have economic success um, and uh, more jobs in our country with this climate policy. 
These facts demonstrate at the same time the extraordinary economic dynamics in the sector. In only two years, employment has risen by 50% to reach 235,000 jobs today in the field of renewable energies in my country. The wind power in industry, which has significantly increased its export activities, is playing a very important role. Solar energy in Germany has experienced a growth rate of over 60% in three years and already provides around 40,000 jobs. And, uh, um, but the development does not stop here uh, and does not stop there. We are planning to continue the expansion of renewable energies on the basis of the decisions adopted recently by the German government, renewable energies can reach a share of up to 30% in electricity supply, but by the year 2020, we have paved the way to this to happen, and we think that we can double the jobs in the field of the renewable sector by more than 400,000 jobs up to the year 2020. One thing is clear. Ambitious targets are important because they offer orientation and provide investors with security. Still, the right policy framework is even more important. The key to German success is to be found in the Renewable Energy Sources Act. This piece of legislation is a highly effective instrument for supporting the market introduction of renewable energies on the electricity market, an instrument that is copied all over the world more than 40 countries are now using similar instruments, and one of these countries is China. We will actively support the expansion of renewable energies in the heat sector and in transport too. Uh, the building sector, with, with its high energy consumption in particular, is a sleeping giant for renewable energies, and we want to have to wake up it. And uh, a lot more can be achieved in this context. Uh, chairman and honorable members of the selected committee, all these uh, opportunities in the, uh, in the business sector depends on two questions. We must come in Bali to a comprehensive negotiations on the post-2012 climate regime worldwide, and there is heavy pressure to act, as the IPCC report confirmed once more this year. Our goal for Bali is to adopt a roadmap which lays down the contents and the timetable for negotiations until 2009. And the topics of the agenda are clear. We have to agree on long-term reduction target and, of course, on mid-term targets. And we have to agree on market-based instruments and carbon pricing. And we want to negotiate with all members of the United Nations about the responsibilities, common but differentiated responsibilities, and we want to negotiate about uh, technology transfer and about uh, adaptation of the existing climate change. And I think that it's necessary for the United States to participate in these negotiations, not only because the United Nations is one of the big emitters. Sometimes in Europe and in Germany, uh, it's, it's something like a blame game where everybody wants to show to the United States because they are the big emitters. But I think there is another uh, reason why we need the United States. The United States is the most dynamic economy worldwide. It's the most important economy worldwide. It's, the, uh, it's an economy with a huge uh, potential of research and development in all fee, fee, fields of the energy sector and of advanced energy technologies. Nobody worldwide can uh, solve the problem without this dynamic and the power of the United, uh, United States economy. So this is for me the biggest reason uh, to, uh, to discuss and to negotiate with the United States because without the help of the United States we will not solve the problem. Thank you Mr. Chair for your attention. Thank, th thank you Mr. Uh, Gabriel as well. We very much appreciate it. Now we'll turn to uh, questions from the um, select committee for our panel. And, uh, I'd like to be, just begin by asking each of you uh, um, a simple question, and uh, uh, maybe we can begin with you, uh, Dr. Brundtland. Um, you, you were the head of the World Health Organization, you're a physician, and clearly you led the global effort on preventative care um, for your term there. Um, the central question, it seems, uh, 
is whether or not you believe that carbon dioxide and their emissions are a danger to public health uh, and welfare. Uh, do you believe that they are? Well, I think the, uh, you know, the IPC uh, report uh, is very clear uh, on the effects of CO2 emissions. Uh, so I think there is no doubt. But uh, directly on human health, there are other pollutants that are directly affecting human health more strongly, like SO2 and others that we have been dealing with. But in, in terms of the question of whether or not yeah. CO2 is causing uh, it, is causing, it is warming. causing global warming, no doubt at all. And uh, in fact, just speaking from my experience and from my time as Norwegian Prime Minister, um, I mean, we shocked uh, the world, especially the Gulf and uh, other oil producing states, when we introduced a CO2 tax already in 1990. And what has, what has happened after that? Our continental shelf has only one third of the emissions of the global average. Why? Because we introduced the CO2 tax that made it an inspiration and incentive for the oil industry to make changes. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gabriel, do you agree that CO2 is the principal cause for global warming? CO2 and other greenhouse gases, of course. Of There's course. no doubt. Do you agree with that, uh, Mr. Lagos? I think that today, Nobody can question from the scientific point of view. I think that the important issue with the United Nations report is that uh, from the point of view of science, there's no question that this is, the, this is the cause of global warming. And therefore, this is the reason probably why in today's agenda is in so high in the global, as a global problem and they need then to take some concrete measures. I mean, the discussion on science, I think, is over and now it's time for action. Uh, Mr. Hahn? Well, I think uh, IPCC report uh, told us that uh, science is clear that the current issue is created by the human activities and industrial development, for example. During the last, for example, 200 years, the average um, increase in uh, temperature was 0 0.74 uh, degrees centigrade. But uh, if we are left without doing anything, this will increase tremendously by the end of this century. Well, I agree with each of you that CO2 is a danger to the planet. Uh, but unfortunately, the environmental minister of the United States, uh, Stephen Johnson, sat at that table just three months ago and told the Select Committee that he had yet to make up his mind as to whether or not CO2 uh, was a danger to the planet, and when we asked him when he was going to make up his mind, um, he said he did not know, and to this date he still has not made up his mind. So the environmental minister of the United States is still undecided on this issue. So the debate is not over in the uh, United States. So the world has been asked to come to Washington to discuss this issue later on this week. but. It's a little bit like being invited to a prayer breakfast with a group of fellow believers, but the meeting is hosted by an atheist um, because the American environmental minister and this White House has yet to decide whether or not the sin has been committed by emitting these carbon uh, CO2 um, emissions into the atmosphere. Um, so, Minister um, Gabriel, um, do you believe that experience has proven that we need mandatory controls in order to be um, uh, successful uh, in dealing with this problem? And then I would ask um, uh, Dr. Bruntland and the others yeah. if they would like to respond as well. Is a mandatory regime necessary? I think a mandatory regime is necessary and of course carbon pricing is necessary because today the costs of the consequences of climate change are socialized. There are costs for the cons because of the consequences of climate change. You can see it in your own country. You can see it in Mexico because of the hurricanes. You can see it in Germany because of floods. But the price and the costs of these consequences are not implemented 
in the production of energy uh, and in the consumption of energy. The costs of the consequences are socialized. It's something like a socialism in giving the costs to the taxpayers and to everybody in the community and in the society. And I think it's necessary to bring the costs inside the energy production and the, the industrial production. When we go back to the, to the 70s and the 80s, we saw that our landfills were full. And we saw it was dangerous because the, 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 the water was polluted out of the landfills. And the first thing we did to give waste a price and to say, OK, you can bring the waste to the landfills, but then it's very expensive. And so the industry thought about coming out of this circle, and they thought about the design of the products that at the end of the life cycle, they don't want to bring it to the waste deposit because they don't want to pay so much. And so we get other products. The people in my country, they consume much more than 20 years ago, but we have less waste. Uh, we do not tell the people we do not want to have growth, we do not have to, to, to so much cons uh, consume of products. We tell them only, please think about if you want to bring so much waste to the wet landfill. And carbon dioxide is waste, we bring it in the atmosphere. We made the atmosphere to a waste deposit. And the only thing to reduce the waste is to give monetary reduction and carbon prices. This is the only way. If you do not, then it's, then, then it's very cheap to produce carbon dioxide. It's cheaper because the costs of the consequences of carbon dioxide are socialized. So, uh, Dr. Brundtland and your colleagues, do you believe that a mandatory system is necessary in order to drive the technology and to create the new jobs in this uh, sector to deal with the issue? To, to find a, a global and comprehensive solution to an already dramatic but increasing problem, I do believe we need mandatory uh, solutions. However, I think we should be, and, and this is necessary for the, for the world to find a combined and uh, useful solution for the future. But every country and every industry can, even before we have such a deal, uh, do a lot in, in exactly in the terms that Mr. Gabriel, Gabriel was just now uh, addressing. I mean, the example I gave from the Norwegian continental shelf is just one of many. You influence the market, you make incentives and disincentives uh, so that uh, industries have the right signals about the future and about the way to deal with it. But we need um, a, a carbon price and we need a market which can effectively uh, internalize into the production cost uh, the cost of the damage that uh, CO2 and other emissions create. Okay. Uh, my time has expired. Let me turn and recognize the ranking member, the gentleman yeah. from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, let me say that with the discussions that I've heard this morning and what I've been hearing the last few months, I am really discouraged about uh, any type of a framework coming out of the Bali conference uh, that will have you know, any chance of public acceptance or ratification in the United States. And I can see history repeating itself uh, uh, on Kyoto in the 21st century as a result of the Bali Conference. I'd like to make a couple of points. I'm not going to ask any questions, but I hope you'll listen to these points because I've been involved in this issue for about 12 years. First of all, there will be no mandatory reductions in greenhouse gases acceptable in the United States unless it is worldwide, specifically China and India and other emerging economies like Brazil and Mexico. Uh, otherwise, this treaty ends up being more about jobs and economics and where those are rather than the environment. And that's what the Kyoto Treaty was. Um, Having had a number of bilateral uh, uh, engagements with the Chinese uh, delegation to uh, climate change conferences, uh, they will not uh, agree to any type of mandatory reduction in greenhouse gases. Or if they do so, uh, they'll simply ignore what their international obligations are. 
and China has got a record of doing that. You know, we all thought we'd get rid of intellectual property rights piracy by bringing China into the WTO, and I think everybody who has looked at this realistically realizes that piracy is worse now that China is in the WTO than it was before Chinese accession to the WTO. Uh, the second point I, I'd like to make uh, uh, on this is that in any democracy, uh, uh, telling our voters that uh, going along with this will result in an 80 percent increase in the cost of their electricity, the cost of their natural gas to heat their houses, uh, the cost of the fuel to fuel their automobiles is simply not sustainable. And that's what President Clinton's direct appointee testified before the Congress in 1998. You know, it simply can't be done. And all of you have run for office and have served in government uh, in your respective countries before. You, know, you can't go tell your voters that an 80 percent increase in the cost of what they have to pay to live uh, is something that is going to, number one, get you reelected, but number two, uh, will not push the pendulum so far over into the other direction uh, that there will be in the next election just a complete and utter rejection of these types of policies. And I want to give you uh, two examples of this. George W. Bush would not be the President of the United States today. Uh, Al Gore would be the President of the United States today. If it were not for Gore's uh, embracing of the Kyoto Protocol, which was a significant impact in him losing West Virginia and Ohio in the 2000 election. Uh, the 2000 election was the first election where a Republican carried West Virginia in a non-incumbent uh, race since 1928. Um, uh, the other thing is, is the one of the things that helped the Republicans win control of the Congress in 1994 was the carbon tax that Mr. Gore uh, proposed and which uh, the House of Representatives passed, but which the Senate did not pass. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that carbon tax ended up being lethal in the eyes of the American voters. Now, we all know that politics is the art of the possible. And I'd like to see something happen in this uh, area, but it has got to be both economically sustainable and politically sustainable. Without China agreeing to some type of reduction in greenhouse gases, it will be neither in the United States. Uh, and uh, I don't think that any of us want to get on board any kind of an international treaty that ends up outsourcing more American jobs to countries like China and like India. Uh, you know, this is my message. It is a message that is sincerely given. Uh, you look back at what happened over the last 12 years, and I think the biggest mistake that was made uh, in the entire process leading up to Kyoto and subsequent to Kyoto was the decision that was made in Berlin in 1995 to exempt the third world uh, from any type of greenhouse gas emissions and to give the European Union a significantly less reduction uh, quota in greenhouse gases because of a couple of factors that are entirely unrelated to this issue. Thank you. Great. The um, gentleman's time has expired. Um, would you mind if Mr. Lagos responded? Sure. You, you're recognized for that purpose. I, I, I would like, uh, on a personal capacity, try to to give uh, some ideas about uh, what Mr. Sensum Renner has just said. I, I can understand very clear the point number one. Mandatory reduction has to be made uh, worldwide, or at least among the major emitters. The, the big issue, I think, is that if we are thinking in terms of common but differentiated responsibilities, if you take a large country like Brazil with the responsibilities about deforestation, it may be that the major contribution by Brazil has to do to diminish the degree of deforestation of the Amazonian, and that may be as important as putting a cap on, on the, from the point of view yeah. of the emission, because given that way, you are going to reduce at the well level yeah. what's going to happen. Mr. Lagos, if I can interrupt, uh, one, yeah. one of the places where the negotiations completely fell apart in the Netherlands in 2000 was on the issue of reforestation because the European Union was absolutely adamant that there would not be a significant reforestation credit by those countries that well, did that. 
I, I, I know that. The point is this. I think that the time has come in order trying to think some kind of variable geometry, and I don't think that one size will fit all. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me that it's possible to think in some ways in order to break the deadlock that you have now. Uh, with regard to the second point, with regard to the cost that we have today, uh, at least in my country, and we have a, a higher cost of uh, pricing energy in my country than in the US, and probably because that is the reason why, now some renewable energies like wind are becoming as competitive, assuming that the actual prices of gas are going to remain. And if you have that assumption, then renewable energies are going to be more and more, and here I think that it's extremely important what uh, Minister Gabriel mentioned about the research and development and the role that the U.S. economy can play with regard to that point. I think that that's an extremely important issue. And finally, what I would like to say in, 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 from our point of view of what happened in Chile, I think that it's essential to have some kind of price on carbon emissions. Either through, I don't think that taxes is going to be the most uh, uh, fashionable, but cap and trade, I think, is extremely important and some kind of regulations. And therefore, it is possible from the point of view of the private sector to think in ways in order to be able to fulfill both things. At the end, and I finish with this, I think that now technology allow us to decouple growth and emissions. And this is really what is important in this 21st century. Great. Thank you. Did you Thank want you to add sir. something, Minister Gabriel? Yeah, but it's possible because I think that uh, Honorable uh, Senator Sensenbrenn has made a very important point in the international discussions. Of course, also in Europe it's a discussion if it's possible to have a fair competition between those uh, um, uh, states who are willing to be engaged in the international climate regime and those maybe who are not or not today, uh, for example China. One of the ideas we discussed in the European Union is that we want to have an auctioning of the allowances in the emission trading system and for this part, for, 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 the, for the part of the of the uh, business sector, which is an international in, in an international competition situation, uh, maybe for the steel sector or the automotive sector, they will get the costs for the carbon dioxide um, allowances back if they went go outside in the market uh, to countries which are not uh, um, members of the international climate regime. Um, this is one of the something like a payback, uh, like we have uh, uh, in, in uh, some sorts of taxes, uh, because um, uh, we all know that uh, China and others have to come on board, but we don't know w if it's possible to bring them on board uh, in the next years. Maybe we need a long, longer time, uh, and we'll, we need mitigation targets, not reduction targets. Uh, and we need no lose targets. And for this time in the European Union, we have a discussion, it's not uh, decided uh, right now, that from the year 2013 on, we will auction 100% uh, 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 of the allowances in the industrial sector and the electricity sector. And for those parts of the industrial sector who are in, in an international competition, like steel or chemistry or, or automotive, we get a payback uh, of the of the uh, carbon dioxide costs uh, to have a fair competition with those countries who are not willing or not able to be members of the international uh, uh, climate regime. This is one of the discussions we have to put on the table because when I can say it, when I, I'm, I'm only two years uh, in these international negotiations and on the official agenda we are discussing about climate. But there is an unofficial agenda, and everybody discusses much more about the unofficial agenda than about the official agenda. And the unofficial agenda is economic success and economic development. And we put those both parts of the negotiations officially on the table and discuss it very honestly and very frankly. Without this honest and frank debate, we will not solve the problem. Okay, thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. You got me just about leaving. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
and the distinguished panel. Uh, you know, when I go out into my district and into California, uh, my home state, I am very encouraged by what I see in terms of uh, developing uh, new energy technologies in the biofields, uh, in, in uh, wind energy, which I uh, spent my career in, solar energy, and also in the um, uh, conservation aspects, new cars that uh, run on electricity and so on. Uh, but I also see how difficult it will be to get our own country uh, involved in the climate change challenge, uh, despite the obvious risk that climate change poses to our country. So I believe for the time being it is going to be up to the Congress uh, rather than the executive to move forward. Uh, and um, that is a tremendous opportunity for us, because we get to go out there and meet with the international community, develop the relationships, uh, and open up this new chapter in history of cooperation. Um, but uh, with history as a guide, I would like to ask panel members uh, how much you think is possible to achieve in Bali uh, and uh, how should we best prepare for that conference? Well, I may I come back to the remark made by Mr. Sensenbrenner and then come to yours. To address the challenge of climate change, mandatory capping is necessary but not sufficient. And according to the Kyoto Protocol, there are other mechanisms. We have to reinforce market mechanism apart from this mandatory capping. And as you may know, Kyoto mechanism has three components, joint implementation, clean development mechanism, and uh, emission trading. Now, um, this Kyoto mechanism is the only mechanism which can involve non-Annex One nations, China, India, all those. So in the next round of um, negotiation in Bali, I hope to see this aspect more uh, deeply negotiated. And um, Bali, of course, in Bali we need uh, very strong leadership by the United States uh, in dealing with uh, these problems. Technology is also very important, and technological innovation can only be uh, supplied by the U.S. participation. Otherwise, we cannot do much. So um, in um, complementing the mandatory capping on emissions, we need uh, reinforcing the market mechanism through Kyoto, me Kyoto mechanism, as well as um, stimulating technological innovation. These should be the components that we have to discuss in Bali in December. I will yield, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our guests. I apologize for coming in late. We have such a busy schedule here. But I am uh, very pleased to uh, hear from the panelists that I did uh, get to hear your statements from and just wanted to say what a pleasure it was to visit Germany and members of the UN uh, this past uh, year. We spent time with our select committee meeting with dignitaries and with Chancellor uh, from Germany as well and, and learned a great deal about what is happening in uh, Eastern European countries and how far advanced they are. And the notion, Mr. Gabriel, regarding uh, economic um, growth as one, one major part and aspect of, of controlling uh, climate change, the negative parts of it, I think is something that has to be underscored time and time again. And I know in Germany it is a bit different than it is here. When you talked about the socialization of who pays for this cost, indeed you are right. You hit something that I haven't heard put, in that, put quite in that way. And, and I believe that our job as members of Congress, because we do have a different perspective from our administration, uh, is that we do want to see more responsibility and transparency by our corporations and those individuals that are indeed contributing to uh, climate change in a negative way. And I think it is unfair for, commu for communities, and communities in particular that I represent, that are underserved, that are low income, uh, that don't have the adequate assets to combat the degradation that occurs because of negative climate change. And you talked very eloquently about what we are seeing now occurring throughout the world, hurricanes in Latin America. In fact, yesterday we passed a resolution to help the victims of Honduras and Nicaragua because of the vast number of hurricanes over a very short period of time. For many people of color in the United States, we know what it is not to address these negative impacts. But tell me, if you can, how we can convince 
uh, our delegation or members that will be represented in this upcoming meeting how best that we can convince our leadership, our so-called leadership, to help work on these issues. And then one quick question for also Mrs. Bruntland. I know you're very engaged in health care issues, and we care very deeply about the negative impacts that we're seeing with respect to our children here in the U.S. because of contaminants in the air, particulate matter, and contaminants in the drinking water and many issues that, that both of you are concerned with it just in the short time I've been here to hear you um, are of great interest to many people that I represent. So if both of you or anyone else would like to chime in, I'd like to hear what you have to say. How best can we get our country to understand that this is a crisis? Well, uh, uh, Congressman, you were um, uh, also addressing what Gab Mr. Gabriel was saying, and I think the way he expressed, you know, you know uh, the way it is, the, the pollution and the negative consequences are socialized, you know, into society, made to be uh, paid by everyone, instead of the principle that the U.S. has been following, and the, the whole of the OECD countries have been following for decades, the principle polluter pays. That, that's, it's the only logical way to reduce pollution is to keep to the polluter pays principle. Now, uh, so it really is relatively simple uh, if you don't look at the water and the air as a free commodity that you can pollute without any consequences. This way you can think about children and health with regard to water and air, the breathing of particulate uh, substances, etc. And of course in developing countries, people, women are standing with their child on their back while they are cooking with wood or coal-fired uh, furnaces and the, they are getting the air pollution directly, you know, in addition to the pollution of the atmosphere. So th this, these things are very strongly linked, but the principle, the way of thinking, is important. Why should everyone pay right. uh, when they have no part in, uh, in what you, uh, was You make a very good point, and one of the dilemmas that we have been facing here in Congress, at least in the six, seven years I've been here, is that we have an agency, as was alluded uh, by our chairman for EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, that is charged with trying to provide enforcement of those polluters. And we've had a heck of a time trying to make sure that, lo that laws that are currently codified are enforced and that there is actual punishment and penalty for many of these corporations that have, ma have been major polluters and continue to pollute. And I think that that's the irony that, that we're facing here as members of Congress who would like to see a change in direction in how we can try to address that. I had one, also one other point with regard to the carbon pricing, and it has a little relevance to what Mr. Sensenbrenner was saying um, about China. You know, we talked about the clean development mechanism. It's already there in the present system. It's not perfect, and it's one of the things that also Mr. Hahn was referring to. Those uh, market-based mechanisms have to be improved, and they can be. There are many ideas how they can be working more effectively, but already today, there is a carbon price in China because of the clean development mechanism. They are, you know, um, making economic sense to the Chinese already by using it. There is a carbon price and it affects the way that uh, their energy sector is, is moving forward. And uh, it is happening already that it has an effect. So it's not that nothing happens in China. You know, I just wanted to say Thank even you. the Kyoto protocol itself has created a certain starting uh, atmosphere of, of, of change, and we can improve it a lot with the help of the United States also. Well, let me, let me first of all thank you each for coming here. Um, there are two roll calls on the House floor right now, which is why the members have left to go and to cast those votes. And we had agreed that this meeting would um, end at 11.30. It's now 12 minutes past 11. Um, and uh, I do wish that we could continue it, not just for 18 more well minutes, but for uh, hours, to be honest with you. There's so much that we can learn from you. Uh, you are the global leaders. Um, this meeting taking place in Washington at the end of this week is a critical juncture. 
uh, the White House has to have a dose of reality delivered to it with regard to how dangerous CO2 is and uh, how sincere the rest of the world is in dealing with this issue. Uh, we thank you for your leadership. Uh, we um, apologize for shortening this briefing, um, but uh, the roll calls on the House floor are the, an integral part of our responsibilities to cast the votes. Um, and with that, we adjourn uh, this briefing. Thank you.